It's October 3rd, and these beautiful grapes are destined to become some of the finest wine I have ever had the privilege to drink. Today they will begin their transformation under the direction of master winemaker and fellow Solaro Lodge brother, Sal Mortarano. When he was a youngster, Sal watched from the basement steps as his grandfather and his friends made wine. Years ago, the crank was turned by hand and the vats were wood. Nowadays, the crusher is motorized and the big vats are food grade plastic. On this special day, Sal and his friends, Dave, Tom, Jim, and Rich, continue the winemaking tradition. I asked Sal, where do the grapes come from? The grapes are grown in California and shipped to New York. We get them from a wholesaler uh, in Glen Cove, Izzo's. There are 39 cases of grapes. We we'll hope to get 90 gallons of wine. The grapes that we got uh, came on the 29th of September and we put them out here and we covered them with uh, a tarp to keep the bees and, and, and the fruit flies away which wouldn't have any bacteria to contaminate the wine. The reason why it waits for three days, they come refrigerated and you'd like the temperature to stabilize. If the fruit is too cold, the fermentation process will not stop. The first process of making wine is running it through the machine, uh, destemming and crushing uh, the grapes. They call that musk, and that's now contained in a primary fermentation vat. The machine we're using is a modern version. My grandfather used a machine that was similar, but it was hand cranked, which, contained, which made, took an awful lot of time to do. And now we're modernized. This is the waste, this is the stems. The reason why you pick the stems out of the musk is because the stems will make the wine bitter. And you don't want that. Okay, we don't fill the vat up completely to the top when we do the crushing. Only because you fill it up maybe three quarters of the way up because when the fermentation process happens, it rises. And you need that room for the grapes to expand to come up. If it doesn't, you'll have an overflow. It'll be all over the floor. Uh, the question is, why do we um, have why do the grapes rise in the Well, what happens is that the juice goes to the bottom and the skins rise to the top. But the juice can't be wine without the fermentation process, which happens from the skins only. If you only have the juice without the skins, you're going to have to add yeast. Well, where is the yeast in the grape? It's in the skin itself. It fermentates. It takes about seven to ten days for it to fermentate, and from there you can make start making your wine. I started making wine from juice. And it's good because you know it's cheap and I can make it 12 months out of the year. Yeah, but the problem with the juice is you have to add yeast and chemicals to it. And when you don't use the skins from the grape, you don't get the fermentation. Yeah, you're, you're right. However, it is the cheapest way to do it. It's the easier way. Right. And then when, when Andy started making it, like my grandfather, I jumped on it right away. Right. So this is a natural process, and the only thing is in this wine 
is what God put in your grapes. Absolutely. And the way he's telling you the content of alcohol is you got to use a hydrometer to measure it. Good. See, with the juice, it's so controlled. No, you know, it's it's more than doing that. Okay, but when you're making it it's from scratch, it's great to have that every time. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay. If the temperature averages 75 degrees to 82 degrees, in seven days it should be white. Not completely finished, you have to go through a secondary fermentation process. This allows the remaining sugars in the musk to be consumed and turned into alcohol and also settle out any of the sediment particles that remain in the musk after we squeeze it up. But as of right now, if you were to drink this today, you have grape juice. Right. I'm going to measure the sugar content and take a brisk test to find out the sugar content for the grapes. After that, I'll cover it with a sheet. As the yeast consumes the sugars, it emits a carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide will build a barrier under the sheet to prevent the oxygen from going into the mix and spoiling the wine. After seven to 10 days, I remove the sheet and I will take another breast test to look at the sugar content. If it's not totally consumed, we will leave it in a little bit longer. Temperature is crucial to fermentation. If the temperature is too cool, the fermentation will be retarded some. Once the sugar content is where we want it, we will take all the musk, we will squeeze it with, with the press, and take all the liquids and put it in the second fermentation barrels, and there she'll stay until we bottle it in May. Now what we're going to do is measure the brisk, which is the, up, uh, the sugar content of the musk. There's a scale here that says brisk. <clears throat> you want to get into the liquid. So right now our brisk test is sitting at 12 and a half percent. We want it to go down to zero. And then it will go down to zero. That means the sugars have been all consumed and turned into alcohol. Yeah. We'll try the, the next one. Should be the same. This is about 12 percent, which the margin of error is the operator, not the, <laughs> not the brisk. After all the grapes are crushed and put in a primary fermentation vat, we cover it with a sheet. This prevents the oxygen from getting into the primary fermentation vat. In addition, as the yeast on the skins consumes the sugars in the grapes, it emits a carbon dioxide, which keeps also the oxygen from entering the wine and ru ruining the outcome. Then uh, twice a day, I come in here with a five gallon bucket and I squish it all down. They separate the grapes? They, yeah, they separated, well the skins are still in there, right? And all the stems are out, man, look at the stems. Yeah, it really, it really worked out great. I have a short video. Unit. But this is a Zinfandel and that's... It, no, it's everything. It's all, it's all blended all together. Blended yeah, it's a Zinfandel and Barbara and then two other different types. And proper proportions. That's it. What were the other great The next grapes? step is to punch down the musk. What I mean by that, we take a five gallon food grade plastic pail and we push the skins into the liquid. This allows the yeast on the skins to come in contact with the liquid and consume the rest of the sugars. That process takes anywhere from seven to ten days depending on the temperature and the rate of fermentation. That's all checked with a hydrometer to see the alcohol sugar content. What you're looking at is our secondary fermentation uh, tanks. There's where we're going to move our wine for the secondary fermentation. Up on top, this is a pump. And we use this pump because in the process, after four months, I am going to re-rack the wine. Re-racking the wine means pumping it from one to an empty one leaving the sediments behind. After that, it will stay the remainder of the time, and then we will bottle it in gallon bottles, uh, which you'll see over there, and then it's ready to be consumed.
-hmm. After bottling it, we put it. I put it in gallon jugs like this for storage. As time goes on, I will transfer the gallon bottles into 750 liter bottles and then bring that up to the table and drink that. The wine that we're making is a recipe that we developed over the years. It contains five different grapes. Some grapes are selected for sugars, others for juice content, and others for taste, which makes an excellent table. Unfortunately, I'm not at liberty to tell you the great grape for you, as that is our recipe and our secret. After the musk is stabilized and all the sugars have been contained, we will now take all the musk and put it in the press to press all the juices from the skins. The skins later can be used to make grappa or whatever. We then take all that liquid, now it's wine, we put it in the secondary fermentation barrels and we let that ferment until approximately May. In May, we will bottle the wine. After May, I like to wait a year before we consume the wine. Now we make our own wine for a simple process that it's all natural. We don't add any sugars, no preservatives. What you get in our wine is what God put in the grapes. When you buy wine, you have all kinds of sulfates and other preservatives. And we heard that some wines actually have contained arsenic. That's why when you drink our table wine, the next morning, you don't have a headache. This is a fermented musk. Uh, the specific gravity and brisk is one or less. It's ready to be pressed and the liquid to be put in the secondary uh, fermentation barrel. After that, it'll stay four months and we rack it to get the sediment out. Four months later, it's ready to be bottled and usually a year from then, I will drink it. <laughs> wow, Dave, I can't believe that only after seven days, the, the smell from these grapes is amazing. It smells like wine and it brings me back to Brooklyn where my grandfather used to make wine and in the cellar and you would walk in that room and the smell would just overpower you. It's, it's just amazing. I, I love hearing that. It's seven, what, Monday to Monday. And it's wine. It's delicious. It smells so good. You don't want to drink it right now. I, mean, I would you, like to drink can, it right now. You can, you can <laughs> but this is what we're going to be squeezed. We're going to the juices on the bottom. This is what we're going to be squeezed or crushing that out later on. Wonderful. But right now, it's wine. It needs to age, and we're going to have a good time. And um, come May, you could we sometimes drink it, but then it's actually the best. I would say um, about a year and maybe 14 months after this. But it's just such a beautiful mm -hmm. thing knowing that there's nothing in here but grapes. And the natural process that the Lord provided for it smells us smells fantastic, and the bees like it too. Uh, I've never seen this is the this is the worst <laughs> I've ever seen with bees. I mean the uh, uh, the yellow jackets they've been all over, but they don't bother you. They're in my eyes, my ears every t the twice a day. I come down here and uh, push it down. Beautiful thing. A uh, little known fact: I do this with no clothes on usually. So. Uh, <laughs> But it's all fun. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you for saying that story. You're welcome. This is a typical wine press. Um, you see very some variations, but basically they're all made this way. So we take the musk out of the fermentation barrel. We we'll put it in here. We we'll add the spaces so it's fill up, and then blocks on top of this, and we we'll ratchet this down until it squeezes all the musk. The juice will be captured in a bucket over here, then the juice will be moved into the secondary fermentation barrels. Basically that's the process. Uh, this is what exactly like the one my grandfather used. It isn't the one he used, but like I said, they're all basically built the same. Do you remember them as a child? Well, speaking of grandfathers, I just came with Dave today to see what was going on, but as soon as I saw this press, it reminded me of going to my grandparents' house and going in the basement and there was a, a little room in the, in the front of the basement that had a press just like this. And I used to go in the basement, see the press and the smell of wine just overcame you as you walked in there. And I can't believe it, that I'm going back uh, 65 years and remembering my grandparents' house. And I wish that I had my grandfather's wine press. 
and I never knew him. Uh, but I know that they drank his years for his wine for many years. And so I'm so glad that I came today to see this. This is the finished product. Sal even has his own custom label. We'll be enjoying this wine while we chat under this beautiful shady arbor made, of course, with grapevines. Salute. Cheers. Sal, this is absolutely delicious. Thank you. How long have you been making wine? About 20 years. 20 years. And how did you get started? I got started uh, making wine from juice. One, it was, it was a cheap way to get started. Two, you can make wine 12 months out of the year. Not to worry, you don't have to worry about when grapes are ripe. And I was making it all by myself. And we make it six to 12 gallons at a time. And I was very happy with it. And a few years back, I, I had a gathering. A friend of the families we knew was making wine. His brother-in-law wanted to make white wine. And Andy says, I don't make white wine, it's very difficult, I don't want to do it, I'm not going to try it. So I told him, I says, well, you want to make white wine? He says, of course. So <clears throat> I started making wine with a kit from him, with him. Mm -hmm. And he enjoyed it. And the following year, Andy and I started making wine from great. And this is the result. Okay, so Andy <coughs> really taught you how to do the, the from the great process, which is different from the juice. Oh, process. absolutely. A A A Andy Walkie is definitely the mentor of this wine. This is also his recipe. Um, he learned from an old timer. And when the old timer retired and moved to Florida, he didn't he want to continue to make wine, but it's it's a process, it's too much work for one person. Okay, too much work is that there is a lot of equipment. Could you tell us about the equipment? Did Andy have all the equipment? Yeah, uh, Andy had a, most of the equipment that, that his ex-partner had, had given him because he knew he was up in age and he couldn't make it no more. So what you, you're going you're gonna to need a primary fer fermentation barrel. We use a food grade plastics. Uh, commercial places would use stainless steel or oak. We, we don't use either stainless steel is expensive. And oak barrels do have a finite life. When you use food grade plastics, you clean them real good and use them year after year after year. So, so he had one, all the equipment. He had a press, he had a um, manual destemmer. And you saw a destemmer that mm -hmm. we use, but he had one we cranked by hand. Okay. Then we got one that we, can, uh, uh, we put a motor on it, and then the new one that we have now. And then, of course, the secondary fermentation barrels, which are expensive, and he had a number of them. And over the years, he has picked some up either on the internet or on garage sales. And that the wine press that you put the musk in, he had that too? Yes, he had that. The one we used was his. Okay. And are, is there any other? Well, you got to get the, the jugs, you got to get jugs, you got to get bottles. Yeah, you got to buy the bottles, and, and you, 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 you need all of that. Do you have a corking machine? Yeah, I have a, what they call a Portuguese corker. It's a simple device. You just put the cork on the top. Put a bottle under it, pull the lever, boom, it goes in. And it goes in. Okay. So, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this beautiful place where, where we're sitting? Okay. This, this arbor was originally built by my wife's grandfather. We kind of figure 1919, 1920. When I bought the house in 1984, it was in total disrepair as the house had been rented for a number of years and it had no care at all. I uh, saw it, I loved it, I rebuilt it the best I could and we keep it basically for shades. Um, I don't use the fruit for wine. The one large vine is actually her grandfather's. I will not cut it down. I let it stay as long as God will let it live. And we have pictures of family members birthday parties going back 60, 70 years under this grape. Wow. And it's all grape farms. These are grape farms. Yeah, they're all grapes. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's the feeling you get sitting under here is so peaceful, so protected, so natural. It's just so wonderful. I realize when they built this, there was not a tree in sight. They called this area Smithtown Lawn. My mother-in-law had a picture, and Sissy has it, when you can look out of the front door of my house and see Jericho Turnpike. Wow. There wasn't a house or a tree standing. So this was a big plain. That's all it was. So this was really needed 
if you were going to do anything sure. outdoors. So, um, how about uh, your wine now? Um, have you ever entered your wine into any competitions? No, I, I, I haven't. Uh, but we did have it evaluated by a fellow, and we did very well, I think. We got 18 out of 20 points. We lost a couple points for clarity, and that didn't bother me at all. Of course, I think the taste is worth a little bit of clarity. I would agree with that. I would absolutely agree with that. Most Americans love beer, but in Italy, wine is the beverage of choice, and Italians love to drink it, with over 42 liters per person consumed every year. Wine is on the table for most meals, and it is viewed by Italians as a delicious and beneficial beverage, a key ingredient to a healthy diet and life. Italy is home to some of the oldest wine producing regions in the world. There are over one million vineyards in almost every regione of the country. And Italy vies with France as the world's largest wine producer and exporter, depending upon yearly vintage. It is said that certain years, Italian wines have represented one-third of the world's total production. Wine was introduced into Sicily and southern Italy before 800 BC by Greek colonists. And by the second century BC, Roman wine production began to flourish. So many large-scale slave-run wine plantations developed that by 92 AD, Emperor Domitian was forced to destroy vineyards to free up fertile land for food production. At the same time, wine production outside of Italy was prohibited. The Romans exported wine in exchange for slaves, especially from Gaul. The oldest surviving wine bottle still containing liquid, called the Speyer wine bottle, belonged to a Roman nobleman and is dated at 325 or 350 AD. Wine was an integral part of the Roman diet, and they believed wine to be a beverage of the gods, given to humanity by Bacchus, their god of wine and revelry. So great importance was given to improving wine production and winemaking technology vastly improved during Roman times. Special rooms were built to optimize wine storage and other techniques were developed to speed up the aging process. You may have tasted wine made with some of the famous Italian grape varieties. The Barbera grape is grown in the Piedmont and Lombardy regions. The Montepulciano is grown in Abruzzo while the Nero d'Avola grows in Sicily. The Nebbiolo, the most noble of Italian grapes, is also grown in the Piedmont. Today, wine connoisseurs from all over the globe cherish Italian wines. Some of the most sought after are the Barolo, the Barbaresco, and the Brunello di Montalcino. Chianti wine is any wine produced in the Chianti region in central Tuscany. 
It was historically associated with a squat bottle enclosed in a straw basket called the Fiasco. However, the Fiasco was only used by a few makers of the wine, as most Chianti is now bottled in more standard shaped wine bottles. While you're drinking your delicious Italian wine, you may want to fare un brindisi, or make a toast. You might say, alla tua salute, or just salute, which means to your health. Chin chin translates as the simple but popular cheers. Per cent'anni, or simply cent'anni, wishes 100 years of good luck and health. Finally, Italians may wish you auguri, best wishes to you and yours. Italian immigrants brought with them their love of wine and expertise in winemaking to the United States. It was common for young Italian Americans to find a cherished wine press and other winemaking paraphernalia in grandpa's basement, and many have enjoyed their homemade wines at family gatherings. Today, members of the Solaro Lodge keep that tradition alive by continuing to make their own homemade wines. Several members of the Solaro Lodge have won top prizes in statewide wine competitions. If you are interested in making your own wine, visit a Solaro Lodge meeting where you will be welcomed and all your questions about winemaking will be answered by one of our many experts. So please, let me wish you salute, centani, and auguri for the next time you pull a cork on a delicious and healthful bottle of Italian wine whether you have bought it in a store or made it by yourself in your own backyard. Thanks for watching.